Hello everyone and welcome back to another True Crime Mysteries video. Thank you all for being here. Today we're discussing three more solved cold cases. Let's get into it. Number 1. Stacy Lynn Chahorsky On the morning of December 16, 1988, two state transportation workers found the body of a very decomposed woman on the side of the Interstate 59 in Dade County, Georgia, close to the Alabama border. By that afternoon, authorities, including the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, arrived at the crime scene. The JBI found no identification on or around the body. They would try fingerprinting with no results. There was very little evidence found at the scene. However, they did find one piece of evidence that may have the killer's DNA on it. It would be saved, as there was not much they could do with evidence of this type in 1988. The JBI believed this woman may have been a hitchhiker who was picked up and then eventually dumped on the side of the road. Her body would have been there for days, if not weeks, before it had been found. She was believed to have been 20 to 25 years old, 125 pounds, and 5 foot 7 tall. She had been wearing an extra large navy blue thermal knit sweater, Calvin Klein blue jeans, a navy blue bra, and ankle high black boots. She had worn a gold chain around her neck and a white gold heart shaped ring on her left pinky finger. After an autopsy, it was discovered that she had been sexually assaulted before her death and had died from strangulation. Her death was ruled a homicide. The unknown woman would eventually be called Rising Fawn Jane Doe. They would try over the years to make updated sketches and clay renderings of what they believed Rising Jane Doe looked like in the hopes of identifying her. Authorities could not identify the Rising Jane Doe for three decades. In the mid-2000s, the case was reassigned. These new JBI investigators would find additional evidence that they could send to the FBI for further testing. They would be able to get a DNA profile of Rising Fawn Jane Doe and enter it to the missing person database. Unfortunately, they would not get a match. In 2015, Rising Fawn Jane Doe's case was reassigned, this time to the JBI cold case unit. It was at this time they would be able to make new clay renderings and composite images of the victim. A social media campaign was undertaken, but again, it did not lead to any positive identification. In March 2022, the JBI and FBI announced that they had finally identified this woman using genetic genealogy. They announced in a press conference that her name was Stacy Lynn Chahorsky. Stacy had been reported missing by her mother in January 1989 from Michigan. Stacy was on a hitchhiking trip through the southern states in the fall of 1988. Her mother had reported her missing after she did not come home for Christmas as planned. Stacy was only 19 when she died. Stacy's mother has since identified the jewelry that was found with Stacy, and her remains have been sent to Michigan. And the case doesn't end there. In September, the JBI and FBI announced in a press conference that they identified Stacy's killer using the same genetic genealogy, making this the first case in Georgia where a victim and killer were identified with the same technology. Stacy's killer was identified as Henry Frederick Haas Wise. Wise was a truck driver who worked a route in the area driving through Chattanooga to Birmingham to Nashville. Wise was also a stunt driver, and in 1999, he died in a stunt car accident. He burned to death. He had a criminal history in several states, which included theft, assault, and obstruction of a police officer. His arrests all predated mandatory DNA testing for felony arrests. On September 6, 2022, the JBI press release stated this, quote, Mary Beth Smith, Stacy Chahorsky's mother, expresses gratitude to the FBI, the JBI, Special Agent Adam James for his relentless pursuit of this case, and JBI forensic artist Marla Lawson for her work on the composite drawings and clay renderings. She also thanks Dade County Sheriff Ray Cross, all the people in Dade County who took care of Stacy as she was brought home to Norton Shores, Michigan, and the Norton Shores Police Department for never giving up on finding her. With very little evidence, the investigators in this case never stopped looking for answers. Number 2. Joette Smith On March 29, 1983, a man was walking his dog on the banks of the San Lorenzo River on the 200 block of Woodland Drive in Ben Lamont, California, when he saw a body floating in the river. She only wore one nylon, a black boot, and a string of pearls. A navy blue cape was found nearby. 
Sheriff's deputies arrived at the crime scene, finding several other pieces of evidence. They quickly identified the woman as Joette Marie Smith. She was 33 and the owner of a popular local restaurant called Buffalo Gals. Joette was described as a remarkable woman, very hospitable, happy, cordial, a woman just full of vigor. She was always there when people needed her. She was last seen on March 28, 1983. Joette closed up the restaurant for the night and went across the street to her studio apartment, which she was sharing with a friend, Rachel Devereaux, at the time. Rachel would stay and work with Joette in the winter months as her 46-acre property would be inaccessible during the winter rainy seasons. The two women watched the TV show Thunderbirds, ate some popcorn before Joette made some phone calls. Joette said she was tired and Rachel went to bed. Rachel woke up at 3 a.m. to find Joette not in the apartment. This was not unusual as Joette often went to the restaurant late at night. Detectives would find out that Joette had left the apartment and walked to a local bar to buy cigarettes. She had tried one shop closer to home, but it was closed. So she had walked to Henflink's Inn, a bar in downtown Ben Lamont. A waitress there who knew Joette had offered her a ride home, but she said it was a lovely night and she wanted to walk. That would be the last known sighting of Joette alive. Detectives believe she might have been stopped on the bridge, which was on her way home. An autopsy would show that she'd been strangled to death and that there may have been a sexual element which they haven't released. Her death was ruled a homicide. There was not much for authorities to go on. They interviewed everyone in Joette's life, talked to people who saw her that night, and came up with nothing. Everyone they spoke to didn't think that Joette had any enemies. Authorities had physical evidence, but nothing to compare it to, and DNA testing was not being used yet. Joette had moved to Ben Lamont 10 years before and had been about to celebrate the 8th anniversary of owning the restaurant, and she was planning a big anniversary celebration. She had moved from Colorado Springs, but had attended college in Kansas. She was originally from Omaha, Nebraska, where her family still resided. Her mother brought her remains back to Nebraska, where she now rests. There would be no leads in her case until 1988, when detectives would have a suspect, a man named Eric David Drummond. He had an extensive criminal history in California and Nevada, which included sexual assault. Detectives would learn that Drummond had asked Joette out on a date and she told him no. Drummond had left California quickly after the murder. They had circumstantial evidence connecting him to the crime, but no case could be brought against him without more physical evidence. Joette's case would eventually go cold. In 2022, her case was reopened in the hopes of using new DNA technology not available in 1983. They were able to get a male DNA sample from the 1983 evidence. In August of 2022, they were able to get a sample of DNA directly from Drummond, now 64 years old. The DNA sample was an exact match for the evidence sample. Unfortunately, while detectives were working on getting an arrest warrant, Drummond committed suicide in September. Though there would not be justice, the friends and family of Joette now have answers. They also input Drummond's DNA into CODIS and are looking to determine if there are any other cold cases that are linked back to him. Joette's sister said in a statement to the media, A long time ago, I just came to the fact that they would probably never identify her killer. This announcement was a little bit of a letdown, but I don't feel like we didn't get justice. The DNA was a match, and it's closure. Number 3. The Package Killer Identified In 1991, several murdered women were determined by FBI profiles to be the work of one person, a serial killer named The Package Killer. On March 26, 1990, a body was found between two mattresses along the highway near Silix, Missouri in Lincoln County. Her hands were bound and her face was covered. An autopsy showed she'd been strangled to death. She was identified as Robin Myhen, a 19-year-old who lived in St. Louis, Missouri. She'd been living as a sex worker. On June 11, 1990, a body was found in a rubber trash can near Highway 55. The body was so decomposed that authorities could not determine the cause of death. She was later identified as Donna Wrightmeyer, a 40-year-old woman who was last seen in the Stroll area of Cherokee Street in St. Louis. She was also a sex worker. On October 4, 1990, a woman's body was found by a jogger near Interstate 270 in a plastic trash can. She had been smothered or strangled. 
the woman remained unidentified for months, but was later identified as 27-year-old Brenda Pruitt, who lived on Cherokee Street, St. Louis. She was reported missing on May 9, 1990, by her family. On February 17, 1991, a body was found in a wooden box by the side of the Interstate 70 in O'Fallon, Missouri, and she was identified as Sandy Little, who was 21 years old and had been reported missing from her home on the 2800 block of Cherokee Street in September 1990. She was also a sex worker. All of these women were mothers with young children at home, disappearing only to be found months later disposed of like garbage. On October 12, 1990, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch newspaper reported that police had questioned a suspect, but the evidence was thin. I couldn't find any other reports, and no person was ever charged for these crimes in 1990. These cases went cold for decades. In 2008, Sergeant Jody Weber of the O'Fallon Police Department took another hard look at these cases. These women were found in multiple jurisdictions, so Weber had to reach out and call each of them individually for their case files. For the next 14 years, she would organize evidence, witness statements, and police reports. Detective Weber would start sending physical evidence to crime labs. She constantly followed up to see if the crime labs had any new information. On April 2022, all the hard work would pay off. With new technology advancements, the St. Charles County Crime Lab was able to get a DNA match from a tiny bit of viable evidence. The match was to a convicted murderer Gary Randall Muehlberg, who is currently serving a life sentence in Potosi Correctional Center for killing Kenneth Atchison in 1993 over a disagreement about money. He had hidden Kenneth's body in a homemade coffin in his basement and was arrested and charged with his murder in 95. Detective Weber then went to the Potosi Correctional Center for two separate times and had showed Muehlberg the DNA evidence. In these interviews, he confessed to killing Myhan, Pruitt, and Little, and gave detailed accounts of the murders in the confession. After the second interview, he sent Detective Weber a letter telling her of two other murders he had committed. When she interviewed him a third time, he gave detailed accounts of the murders he had written in the letters. With that information, she could identify Reitmeier as one of those victims. Unfortunately, with the information given, no other cases could be tied to the unknown Jane Doe Muehlberg had confessed to killing. In September of 2022, after a plea deal had been made to take the death penalty off the table, Gary Muehlberg was charged with the murders of Myhan, Pruitt, Little, and Reitmeier. Law enforcement also revealed that there are more victims whose bodies had never been found or identified. They stated that Muehlberg is believed to be fully cooperating with law enforcement. In an article for St. Louis Public Radio, Jody Weber is quoted as saying, I know it was a long time coming for me for 14 years. I couldn't imagine what it was like for a family member waiting 32 years for answers. With Muehlberg being incarcerated all this time, it also raised questions on if something was missed in the 1993 case he was sentenced for and why it took so long to get the DNA hit. After 30 years and so many hours on this case, the package killer from 1991 has been identified. Law enforcement does want to make it clear that this case is not done. It remains an ongoing investigation that they are willing to work on. I've been waiting since March 26, 1990, so 32 years. Decades later, there is release. My mom can rest in peace now. Yeah. This is one of the days that shows why we do this job. Prosecutors in Lincoln, St. Charles, and St. Louis counties credit cooperation for the murder charges connected to the 1990s strangulations of Robin Myhan, Brenda Pruitt, Donna Reitmeyer, and Sandy Little. Well, that is going to be it for this video. Thank you so much for sticking around to the end. As always, if you want to support the channel, the easiest way is to hit the like button. You can also subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss my next upload. Other ways to support the channel are joining my Patreon or channel membership. I also have merch and you can find all the links in the description box plus a few extras. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter for more. But with all that being said, thank you so much for being here and supporting what I do. It is very appreciated. That is it for me. I will see you all in the next one. Bye for now.